I recently performed an 11 minute unboxing of two of Intel's fourth generation Xeon processors, 36 cores of W9-3475X and 56 cores of W9-3495X. And don't those model codes just trip off the tongue? Provided you've watched that video and you have some understanding of the hardware I have to play with, you'll understand entirely what we're looking at here, which is a Xeon with a huge ASRock motherboard, some very posh Kingston DDR5 ECC memory and this Noctua cooler. But fear not, we also did some liquid cooling. Iron Wolf Pro. Tough, ready, scalable. The arrival of 4th gen Intel Xeon aka Sapphire Rapids is very big news for Team Blue and a large part of the reason is it means that they can forget about 3rd gen Xeon which launched back in 2022. Intel's 3rd gen Xeon processors used a monolithic design and were built on a 10 nanometer process with a maximum core count of 40 so that's 40 cores 80 threads. And you will note, Intel was proud to boast of support for their Optane Persistent Memory 200 series. At that time, Intel was talking a great deal about Optane, but now Optane has been killed off and we can forget about 3rd gen Xeon and move on to 4th gen Xeon. The W for workstation series of processors are divided into two families, expert workstation up to 350 watts, including the two CPUs that we have here, and mainstream workstation CPUs up to 225 watts. As you can see, the Xeon W3400s got up to 56 cores, and that is the W9-3495X that we have on test today. In addition, we have support for DDR5 ECC memory, a huge amount of PCI Express, and no mention of Optane whatsoever. The processors themselves are physically very large, and they absolutely dwarf a processor such as the Core i7-13700K. However, they are almost physically identical in size to an AMD Threadripper. And that's particularly convenient as a comparison because the Threadripper Pro family goes up to 64 cores, 128 threads, which is not a million miles away from the 56 cores 112 threads that Intel now sports. And that's very handy, as KitGuru recently did a roundup of three Threadripper Pro CPUs. The hardware on our test bench is basically a PC, just a really grunty PC. Seasonic Vertex GX 1200 power supply. The motherboard is an ASRock W790WS, i.e. the workstation variant of the Z790. The memory, as mentioned, we've got quad-channel Kingston DDR5 6000 ECC, which in the BIOS is reported as 4800, but then we enable XMP, and voila, 6000. The processor is the 56 core Xeon W9, the SSD is by PNY, is an Accelerate. Graphics card Gigabyte RTX 4080 Gaming OC. And the cooler is this Noctua NHU14SDX4677, which as the 4677 suffix tells us, is intended for this processor socket. It's not a lesser cooler that's been adapted. It has an absolutely enormous base, as you'll see shortly when I remove it. We were sent this cooler just to get the system up and running on a flat test bench. Intel actually said if you're basically doing performance testing or overclocking, for goodness sake, go liquid, which we did indeed do. But this cooler is really impressive on this processor, as I'll show you in just a moment. Worth pointing out, the fan clips interfere with the back plate of the graphics card if the graphics card's in the primary slot. So in this configuration, the graphics cards move down to the next PCI Express slot for liquid cooling, graphics card can be in the correct slot. So the bias of the ASRock motherboard looks entirely conventional. And I'm gonna tell you here and now, I did no fiddling around the bias whatsoever other than the fan curve for the CPU cooler and enabling XMP. And then we can get on and do a little bit of performance testing. Here we are in Windows. And we can see the default power limits for both PL1 and PL2, 4,095 watts, which is effectively infinite. Currently at idle, putting 159 watts just for the CPU. 
We start Cinebench and we see, according to HW Info, the clock speed 633 MHz, while CPU Z's telling us 2.9 GHz all cores. 2.9 GHz is correct. Also, we note package power for the CPU is now 495 watts. The remarkable thing is the CPU temperature is around the 60 Celsius mark. On an air cooler with a CPU that's pulling, albeit cycling through Cinebench, 500 watts. Well done Noctua, and what the heck is going on? Or to put it another way, why is HW Info apparently getting things wrong where CPU Z appears to be getting things right? I use HW Info all the time, it is superb. So I dropped Martin Malik, the author, a line and said essentially what's going on with uh, Sapphire Rapids. He said it's due to HVCI, which is Hypervisor Enforced Code Integrity, uh, i.e. part of Windows 11 security that is now enabled by default. And this prevents access to certain resources. Uh, he also says that HVCI has a negative impact on performance, uh, so it's well worth turning it off because it's using a virtualization uh, workload and that adds an overhead. So I've turned it off and now let's see what happens. And we run Cinebench R23 again. And now the clock speed in HW Info is correct at 2.9 gigahertz all cores. Power draw is a smidgen under 500 watts. And the clock speeds don't boost or deviate. The processor just sits there hammering away. And as Cinebench R23 comes to a close, we see a score of Good Lord, 71,924. The Noctua performed well despite the huge amount of power passing through the CPU. And now let's remove it and go to custom loop. Graphics card is going to be moving as well. Let's just get that out of the way. Retention mechanism for these coolers. So we have this, it is a Torx 6 point uh, key that's supplied with the Noctua and we get a similar Torx key supplied with the EK block that's going to be going on in its place. Slacken off the four fasteners. Your view is actually slightly obscured with this ASRock because we have the active cooling on the VRM heatsink. So you've got three fans at the top of the board. Let's turn the board round. And with all four fasteners slackened, we move these clips in place. So they're now obscuring the heads of the fasteners and we lift. And away comes the cooler with this retention frame and the CPU attached to the retention frame. Uh, it looks like I got it wrong. This is how it's meant to be. And built into the retention frame or clipped in the retention frame, we have this little lever. There we go. CPU removed from Noctua. And then we remove the frame from the cooler. I mentioned earlier that the base of the cooler is enormous. It's just huge. I mean, apart from the area, which obviously matches the CPU, you've also got the thickness. It's just an impressive piece of engineering. The idea that this can handle 500 watts of CPU power and run at 60 Celsius. I, I'm just truly impressed by that. That's at an ambient of 20. You'll note I've slipped the motherboard protective cover into place over the delicate CPU socket. Don't want to risk any damage. We take our lovingly cleaned processor and we have to apply thermal compound to the processor while it's loose. Very unusual. In fact, slightly disconcerting. Now, in the course of testing this processor and its 36 core compatriot, I've done this a few times now, and I found basically a whole series of very small dots all over the place does a decent job. We take the EK block with the attachment frame in place and we slip the processor into place. And the next step is to put the block processor assembly in place. Down with clips and lock home the fasteners.
You can see I've got quick brakes on the components for the cooling system to make life easier. CPU block to pump reservoir. Pump res to radiator. Radiator to CPU block. And now the graphics card. Back in its correct space at the top of the PC. And as the system powers away almost silently, we've got an EK Quantum 360M radiator, so that's the thicker model, the medium of the three thicknesses. We've got three Fantex T30 fans, which are 30mm thick fans, EK D5 pump res unit, and the EK Pro CPU block on the Xeon. When I was testing the Xeon W93495X with the Noctua, it was running at 63 degrees Celsius. With this custom loop setup in previous testing, it was 52 degrees. I've turned the fans down now so I'm a bit of torque over it, and it's running a couple of degrees hotter. But we're in the low 50s Celsius for a CPU that's pulling just about 500 watts. And once again scoring over 71,000 in Cinebench 23. This is an X class of CPU, so how do you go about overclocking it? Nice and easy. In Intel Extreme Tuning Utility, you go to Speed Optimizer. You click Optimize Now. You wait a short while. And bingo, we're done. And now we can see that the power has been set to 500 watts prolonged, 570 boost, which is actually less than we uh, saw with the ASRock BIOS. Clock multiplier has gone from 29 times, i.e. 2.9 gigahertz, to 33 times, 3.3 gigahertz. And let's see how that works in practice. As Cinebench runs, we can see the clock speeds, 3.3 gigahertz all cores. CPU package power, 515 watts which is obviously a tiny step on from the 495 we were seeing previously. Cooling system's working away, but we can see that the temperature hasn't risen at all high, 60, 61 degrees for package temp, which for this amount of power is just remarkable. And the final score in Cinebench R23, 76,419. So let's take a look at performance. In Cinebench R23 multi-core, at the top of the chart, the overclocked Xeon 56 core, 77,000 and a few points. Close behind that, we have the Threadripper Pro 64 core, and then we have the Xeon 56 core running on auto. Just behind that, we have the Xeon 36 core. It's impressive to note the new 56 core Xeon on auto basically scores the same amount of points as the Threadripper Pro running at a slightly higher clock speed. And don't forget, it also has more cores. Power consumption. This is a shocker. Desktop processors are in the 150 to 260 watt range. The Threadripper Pros all come in under 300 watts, and then it starts to climb. The 36 core Xeon on auto, 375. 36 core overclocked, 457. 56 core Xeon, 485 on auto. Overclocked, 513 watts. It's just an absolute fright. CPU temperature in Cinebench R23. I say a variety of coolers as discussed in review because the coolers here are all over the place. The Threadripper Pros were tested with an Ice Giant Pro Siphon. The desktop processors were under a Corsair 360mm AIO. The Xeon's 360mm Custom Loop. So clearly we're not comparing apples with apples. These figures are indicative. The two Xeons on auto, both at 53 degrees. Then we have a couple of the Threadrippers. Then we have the overclocked Xeons, still really cool. Then the Threadripper Pro 5965. Bit of an odd one that. It suggests the silicon there is not the greatest. That's 68. So still very cool. Then the desktop processors, the Ryzen 9 7950X 3D at 80, Core i9 13900K at 87, Ryzen 9 7950X at 95. Cinebench R23 single core. Threadripper Pros are all down the bottom of this chart, all scoring just about 1500 points. Then we step up to the Xeons in the 1600 to 1700 range, 
then the desktop processor is obviously running at far higher clock speeds, scoring over 2,000 points, with the Core i9 scoring 2,102. Blender Classroom, no particular surprises here. The fastest is the Threadripper Pro 64 core, then the Overclock Xeon 56 core, followed by the Xeon 56 core on auto. After that, we have the overclocked 36 core Xeon. Really, this all follows common sense. No surprises to see here. Handbrake conversion. This is an H.264 conversion test, and at the top of the chart, the overclocked Xeons are ahead by a significant margin. Interestingly enough, following that, we have the Core i9-3900K and the two Ryzen 9s. And then we see the Threadripper Pro 64 core, followed by the Xeons running on auto, followed by the other two Threadrippers. Curious numbers there. Handbrake conversion H.265 test. Well, what can we say? The fastest processors are the ones with the highest clock speeds, so the desktop processors followed by the overclocked Xeons, then the Threadrippers, and then the Xeons running on auto. 7-zip benchmark. This is a bit of an odd one because the Threadrippers ran on a version of 7-zip that limited them to 64 threads, so it's not really a fair test, but despite that, they did very nicely. Top of the chart, we have the 56-core Xeon overclocked, followed by the auto 56-core Xeon, then Threadripper, another Threadripper, the Xeon 36-core overclocked, the 24-core Threadripper, the 36-core Xeon on auto, and then the desktop parts. Memory bandwidth. Again, we're not quite comparing apples with apples, and the stunning thing here is... The highest bandwidth goes to Threadrippers running on DDR4. Let that sink in for a moment. Then we move down to the Xeons running DDR5 ECC quad channel. And then we have the desktop parts. And then for a laugh, let's try some gaming at 1440. Because I've tested using the RTX 4080 and the Threadrippers were tested with a different graphics card, we're ignoring them for these three tests. Top of the chart, the Ryzen 9 3D, followed by the Core i9, and then the regular Ryzen 9. Obviously, these processors have much higher clock speeds than our grunty processors. After that, we have the 36-core Xeon overclocked, followed by the 56-core Xeon overclocked. You will note the Xeon with 36 cores running at 3.5 GHz, the 56-core Xeon running at 3.3 GHz, so clock speed is what counts here. Far Cry 6 at 1440. Top of the chart, we have the desktop processors. A small head behind them, we have the 56-core Xeon overclocked, followed by the 36-core Xeon overclocked. You can't really separate those two. Then we have the 56-core Xeon on auto, and at the bottom, the 36-core Xeon on auto. And finally, Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440. Top of the chart with a huge 302 FPS is the Ryzen 9 3D, followed by the Core i9 at 254, and then the Ryzen 9 non-3D at 221. The four Xeons all very close together, all above 180 FPS. It's clear we're scratching the surface of 4th Gen Xeon Sapphire Rapids. For one thing, we've got two examples of the processor, but they're both W3400s, we don't have a W2400. For another, this ASRock motherboard is quite restrictive in terms of memory bandwidth, and that may or may not play a significant part. Also, the software we're using, it's Handbrake, Blender, Cinebench, that kind of thing, rather than hardcore computational fluid dynamics. Uh, these are all factors to consider. Having said that, let's go through the pros and cons. Pros, impressive performance from the high core count models. After all, we now have 56 cores to play with, or up to 56 cores. Previously, you had up to 40 cores. The price is competitive with AMD. Yes, these are expensive parts, 4,000 and 6,000 pounds respectively. But compared to previous Xeons that have been, we've only ever seen on price list, I've never actually had my hands on them, uh, some of those parts are monumentally expensive. These seem reasonably priced, and that's entirely down to AMD, I'm quite sure. Also, the CPU temperatures are icy cold. A lot of power goes through these processors, but they're huge. Therefore, they're not thermally dense, and that helps enormously. The same is also true of Threadripper, Threadripper Pro. Cons, the negatives. Clock speeds are held back by the high power draw. Put it another way, these processors can easily run faster than stock. It's clear that Intel has limited them. 
to save the power being 500 plus watts. Uh, I don't doubt these could be 1000 watt parts if Intel really wanted to, which is a horrifying prospect. And the power draw is far too high compared to AMD. We have to be grateful to AMD for bringing out their various uh, Threadrippers and Epics because they show how things can be. 500 watts is a lot, but compared to sub 300 watt parts, which perform in a very similar manner, the power here is outrageous. And Sapphire Rapids has suffered delay after delay. Put it another way, had these processors come out a year or two years ago, we'd probably look at them in a slightly different light, but things are what they are. We're early in 2023, Sapphire Rapids has finally limped across the line. It's interesting seeing them, but they're not that deeply impressive. And that's really my conclusion here. We are told that Emerald Rapids, the next gen of Xeon, is going to be out later this year, so within nine months. And judging by the images we've seen, uh, Sapphire Rapids uses up to four chiplets, for want of a better word, or processors under the heat spreader. Emerald Rapids appears to use two dies rather than four. I'll be interested to see whether Emerald Rapids uh, only uh, speeds things up by having fewer interconnects or whether we get a leap as we did with on the desktop Alder Lake to Raptor Lake when the P cores stepped forward significantly in terms of performance and also curiously the 13th gen desktop parts are easier to cool than the 12th gen so 5th gen Xeon later this year is what Intel is promising and that may well be a big step forward so yes Fourth gen Xeon Sapphire Rapids is here. It's a little bit meh. Nice to see, but late. Fifth gen, fingers crossed. Be interested to see how that one goes. I'll pick a score for this 56 core Xeon, but it doesn't really mean much. I'm going to say 7.5 out of 10, worth considering. But really, it's more a bit of fun for us to have a play.